Muy buenas noches con todos. Es realmente un placer tener esta, esta conferencia online con el doctor Richard Prey. Hoy día vamos a conversar sobre muchas, muchas preguntas relacionadas a autismo. Les agradecemos a todas las personas que se han unido. Como les comentamos en el grupo, eh, las preguntas van a ser en español y en inglés, las respuestas solamente en inglés, y la próxima semana vamos a hacer la traducción en español para todos. Ok, vamos a empezar entonces. Dr. Richard, thank you very much for, for have today here with us. It's a, a really great pleasure to have you for, commu for our community, CLIA Latinoamérica. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. Well, thank you. Voy a hacer su presentación. El doctor Richard Frey es neurólogo infantil, especialista en trastornos del neurodesarrollo y neurometabólicos. Tiene doctorado en fisiología y biofísica en la Universidad de Georgetown. Es investigador sobre autismo, profesor en la, en la Arizona Children's Hospital de Phoenix. Perteneció al Departamento de Pediatría de la Universidad de Arkansas. Además, es director de la clínica multiespecializada en autismo en Arkansas Children's Hospital. Vaya, se ve. Bueno, vamos a empezar con las preguntas. Conocemos sus grandes contribuciones e investigaciones sobre autismo. En base a eso, nos gustaría saber qué descubrimiento médico sobre autismo le ha sorprendido más y cuál es su definición de autismo. We know of your great contribution and research in autism, and based on that, we would like to know which medical discover about autism has surprised you most, and what is your definition of autism? Well, it's a great question. Um, autism is uh, defined by um, by behavioral symptoms, you know, versus um, that's uh, that's defined by, of course, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, and um, um, and it's 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 somewhat confusing because it is seems like it's a very much of a medical disorder, but it's defined by specific wow. behaviors, and when specific behaviors come together, that is social communication um, problems along with certain types of repetitive behaviors and other types of symptoms. Um, and uh, we know that uh, many of these symptoms originate in the body medically, or we call physiologically, how the body works, but we don't have any good markers, biological markers, to diagnose it with. So we're still left at using these behavioral um, signs to, uh, to diagnose autism. And I think it's very problematic because um, it uh, limits the lower limit of what we can, when we can diagnose autism, because you know, many of these symptoms don't arise until somewhere within the first to second year of life many times, you know? And, and certain things, you know, like certain types of things like uh, social communication are expected into a certain time period. So you really don't know um, until the, uh, the child is supposed to develop certain skills that they're not going to develop it. Um, so I think that um, um, hopefully, as more you know, research goes on, we'll be discovering what the biological basis is so we can you know, diagnose it early, because the one thing we know, you know the, one, the one solid piece of evidence we have is that the sooner you start intervention, the better. And so I think what's very important is to diagnose and intervene early. But unfortunately, right now, we're just still uh, based on a, uh, on a behavioral uh, diagnosis. Um, and so uh, you asked, what is the most surprising? Um, you know, um, so for, for me, um, a little bit about my journey, you know, I am a neurologist. So um, I didn't know anything about autism when I was training, you know, and I learned along the way because of the increased number of cases because uh -huh. children came uh -huh. to my clinic and I wanted to know why they, uh, they had this disorder. And we started to discover some of the um, things that uh, were abnormal in the way their bodies and their brains worked. Um, and, um, of course, um, many back then, and I think continuing, uh, people don't appreciate that there's things that you can do to improve the lives um, of children with autism and maybe improve their symptoms. 
And so I think that was the first thing that was surprising to me and encouraging is that there were things that I could do to help children with autism. And through the years, um, what I've kind of latched onto and become a specialist with is on the metabolic abnormalities that we see with kiddos with autism. You know, it, um, I think it's one piece. It's not the whole thing, you know, but the great thing about metabolic disorders is many times they can be treated. Mm -hmm. If you can find out where the block is in metabolism or why that part of the body isn't working, you can intervene uh, sometimes very easily with certain nutrients or vitamins or, or diets or other things that, um, that uh, can improve mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. uh, the body works. And usually these interventions are somewhat safe and well tolerated. And I think that's, uh, that's very important. Um, so that was, I think, something that was most surprising and I think very encouraging. Okay. Um, ¿Qué aspectos médicos deben considerar los padres para iniciar un tratamiento eficaz? What medical points should parents consider in order to initiate an effective treatment? So, um, one thing I, I know that, uh, that we know is that it's not just one thing. There's not just one magical treatment that is going to fix autism. And um, I like to talk about the one, study that was done. There was an outcome study uh, that asked, well, what is um, for kids that have what we call optimal outcomes that do well, what did the parents do or what was done to make them have these optimal outcomes? And the doctor that um, did this study, Dr. Black, figured he would find out what the one thing was, right, that, uh, that would make them better. But what he found out was there wasn't one thing. It was the kids that recovered, um, the uh, parents worked hard, they advocated for their children, and they tried everything they could um, uh, to, uh, to see what um, was right for their child. And I would say it, it is something that's, um, um, I think, underappreciated that each child with autism is very different. They may not respond to the same thing. They may not respond to the same thing in the same way. And so I think it's very important to um, try things. Mm -hmm. And if they don't work, then you move on and you try something else. Mm -hmm. How many months, approximately? Uh, it depends on the treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but I would give a, a treatment um, a few months. Okay. And then there's the, um, there is the issue that sometimes, you know, treatments need to work in combination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not easy to find that, you know, right combination of treatments. Mm -hmm. But it's important to continue to pursue and persevere. Mm -hmm. You know, even if something doesn't work, try something else. Mm -hmm. And if it's not working... Then, then move on. Don't keep doing something that may not be working. Yeah, that's true. That's true. ¿Alguna prueba que sugiera para los niños como parte de una evaluación normal para comprender lo que podría estar sucediendo? Any test that you suggest for children as part of normal evaluation to understand what's going on? Well, there's um, um, Definitely, it's important um, to have a very comprehensive um, medical examination, and we call medical history, mm -hmm. um, to see what is um, uh, the um, issues of that particular child. Because um, many times, you may not need to do a lot of tests to look for certain things. For example, sleep is something that's uh, disrupted in a lot of children with autism. And we know just by fixing sleep, you know, you can improve their lives and their ability to learn during the day, but you have to ask about it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Same thing with, with certain types of GI um, issues. So I think that um, the first thing definitely is comprehensive, you know, medical evaluation. Um, Uh, the first thing, of course, to do is to make sure a child gets into therapies, mm -hmm. your standard therapies first, um, as first line, because we know that any type of behavioral and, and other types of therapies, speech therapy and such, if it, the earlier it's inter you intervene, the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's a whole number of other tests, whether they be EEGs to look at brain waves, genetic tests to look for any chromosomal um, abnormalities, or metabolic tests metabolic. that can help in certain children, and nutritional tests too. So many children with autism don't eat very well, mm-hmm. and they can have deficiencies in things like vitamin D and zinc and iron and, uh, and CoQ10. And these are things that are very easy to intervene mm-hmm. with, but you have to look for them. So it's good to go to a specialist that understands all these needs so that um, you can have a comprehensive evaluation. Según su experiencia, ¿cuáles han sido los enfoques médicos más exitosos para tratar los síntomas de autismo? In your experience, what have been the most successful medical approaches in treating uh, autism symptoms? Yeah. I think there, there's many medical approaches. I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't know. That I could say that one is more important than the other. Um, again, I think it's important to get a medical diagnosis. Things like improving sleep will improve a child's function. We know that, you know, improving any types of GI pain or GI discomfort or dietary or nutritional um, abnormalities may improve them well. Of course, we've had success with looking at the folate pathway. So we know that some children with with, um, autism are not getting folate into their brain. And we can measure the, what we call biomarker, the blood test that tells us about that. Um, And for some children, I can't say all children, but for some children, it's made a a dramatic change in their lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will ask you that, that in a minute, okay. Acerca del déficit de folato cerebral, ¿qué síntomas se conocen? About the brain folate deficiency, what symptoms are, are known? So we don't know um, so much what the symptoms are. Uh, that is, there doesn't seem to any be any specific symptoms, so to speak. Um, we do know that it seems to be that children that... Um, have the deficiency and respond to the special type of folate we use called leucovorin, um, seem to improve language. It seems to be the most um, obvious thing that improves, although other symptoms do improve. Um, Children that have this uh, deficiency tend to have problems with language, communication, uh, and be um, uh, somewhat lower functioning but not extremely low functioning. So they seem to be children that, uh, that still have language deficits, um, but are, are, are not severely uh, disabled. Um, with that said, some of the kids that are severely disabled may also have cere- cerebral folate deficiency, you know? And so um, we look for it in pretty much every child that comes through. Even children that have um, um, okay language, we find that language improves and becomes more complex, um, and um, and there's more complex understanding um, if they have um, problems with uh, central folate um, abnormalities. But there doesn't seem to be one symptom I can say that really pinpoints it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Siempre es necesario realizar una punción medular. ¿O existen otras pruebas que puedan dar resultados para conocer la deficiencia de folato cerebral o los anticuerpos a los receptores de folato? Is, is it always necessary to obtain the lumbar puncture or are there other tests that can give result to know the, the folate deficiency and, set, and folate autoantibodies? Now, the lumbar puncture is the gold standard for diagnosing cerebral folate deficiency. Um, but um, we found out um, um, early on that um, children that have the folate receptor antibody, which is a blood test, that the titers, how much, how high that that um, um, that titer was, correlated was related to how low their folate level was when you did a lumbar puncture. It's not a, a perfect uh, correlation but it was enough to tell us that 
um, the folate levels might be low. What we started doing is we gave parents an option of whether they uh, wanted a lumbar puncture or they just wanted to try uh, the special type of folate, folinic acid or leucovorin, if they were positive. And um, many parents uh, chose to, um, to try um, the medication without the lumbar puncture and some wanted the lumbar puncture. So um, we found that, uh, that uh, folinic acid or leucovorin seemed safe enough that we thought it was reasonable that you did not have to do the lumbar puncture if you had evidence that, um, that they may not be getting folate into their nervous system. And of course, it's important to follow up to see if they had response to a treatment with uh, folinic acid. The lumbar puncture, I would say, is somewhat of limited um, importance too because we found that some children um, with autism did not have uh, what we would call classic cerebral folate deficiency. That is the lower limit of normal of folate in the nervous system is about 40. But we'd find kids that had low normal levels at 45, 50, who still responded to um, uh, folate um, or leucovorin or folinic acid. <clears throat> so, um, we think that it's pretty reasonable that if you have a reason to try the medication, you have a reasonable suspicion um, that there is cerebral folate deficiency, that a, a trial of leucovorin with uh, close follow-up is uh, helpful. So the two things that would make you suspect that would be, one, having this uh, blood test that tells you that the receptor autoantibody is blocking folate, and the second thing is that we know children that have mitochondrial disorders also are not getting folate into their central nervous system because the same transportation mechanism that's blocked by this antibody also requires a lot of energy. And of course, the mitochondria is what produces all the energy. So if your body doesn't produce energy because of mitochondrial problems, we also know those children tend to have low folate in their central nervous system. Oh, that's really uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So what we do is we usually reserve the lumbar puncture for kiddos that are more complicated, maybe a child that you've, um, you've treated and you're not exactly sure if folate's getting into their nervous system. Mm -hmm. So you can do a lumbar puncture to see what their level is. Maybe they haven't responded. Of course, maybe for other reasons. Um, one of the symptoms of cerebral folate deficiency um, that we see in a subset are, is epilepsy and seizures. And many times kids that have epilepsy um, and don't respond well to anti-epileptic medications will get a lumbar puncture to see if there's anything that's being missed. And of course, it's important to measure a folate level because for children with autism particularly, that could be a reason for seizures that don't respond to standard medications. Wow. Yes. Sobre el síndrome de pandas, algunas pruebas como ACO salen negativas. ¿Qué síntomas o exámenes sugiere para estar seguro de este diagnóstico? About pandas syndrome, some tests like ACO sometimes are negative. What symptoms or other tests do you suggest to be sure about this diagnosis? Right, so I like to be very careful, and I have a whole lecture that I talk about the kind of phenomenon of PANS and PANDAS. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was um, learning about neurologic disorders, children that had an abrupt neurological regression, um, like you see in uh, PANDAS and PANS and some kids, um, had metabolic disorders until proven otherwise. So now it's changed, and a lot of people you think that it's, uh, you know, some type of immune mechanism, you know, like PANS and uh, like, um, uh, like PANDAS. I would say if you look at the definition of um, PANS, it's not very specific for an immune mechanism, and, but uh, people like to kind of jump on that bandwagon, I think, and uh, think that it, it may be. So I think whenever you see um, the um, symptoms where you have an abrupt regression, 
you know, or some type of abrupt increase in symptoms, it's important to take a very broad look at the reason for that because it can be because of something immune. It can be something because of some metabolic. It can also be environmental too. So many cases we find out that there's a, a change in the environment, you know, um, that may have upset the child and, and caused some type of um, uh, regression. So I think it's important to take a broad look. Um, for me, um, yes, I think the ASLO chop titer is very nonspecific. Yeah. Um, so I've definitely seen cases of pandas. Um, I um, use um, usually the Cunningham panel. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is that one of the contributions that Dr. Cunningham has made is that she's found the antibody, the specific antibody produced by the strep, uh, by the bacteria uh, that um, seems to be affecting the neurons. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so ASLO is just a very general, yes. uh, um, and I think that uh, it's very nonspecific. So I usually use one of the advanced tests like the Cunningham panel, specifically the Cunningham panel to help me kind of find out what the cause is. And sometimes it is, sometimes there are cases of, of, of um, appendix. So, but I, ha I think you need to be very careful and you can't assume things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. What is the treatment that you suggest for the treatment panda syndrome? Um, well, it's a it's a very broad term. Um, you know, it's 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 um, it's kind of um, um, it's 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 very it's 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 you know, uh, so um, I think that it all depends on the situation and the severity and the refractory nature um, of the pandas. Okay. Respecto a la disfunción mitocondrial, ¿existe algún polimorfismo genético que pueda sugerir esta disfunción o que pueda estar implicado? About mitochondrial dysfunction, is there a, any genetic polymorphism that suggests it or is involved? So um, the, um, um, what we uh, found, we, uh, we reviewed this um, in a, our paper back in 2012. We reviewed all the evidence for uh, mitochondrial um, uh, dysfunction and disease in children with autism and whether there was any specific genetic abnormalities. And what we found is that um, for the most part, even children with uh, classically defined mitochondrial disease, that only about 20% of them um, had a genetic abnormality that you can point to. Mm -hmm. um, and even with better testing now, I think that the, the numbers are only about 40% or so. And that's children with very classical mitochondrial disease. And what we find is that children with autism have mitochondrial dysfunction, which may be different than classic mitochondrial disease. Um, it, there are many genes um, that will disrupt mitochondrial function, uh, but I don't think we know enough right now to you know, pinpoint it on one specific gene or not. So personally, um, if there's mitochondrial dysfunction or mitochondrial disease, I will look, I will definitely do a genetic workup um, I do a genetic workup anyway in more complex patients too. Um, and uh, what we find many times is that uh, children with uh, genetic abnormalities will have mitochondrial dysfunction. And that just may be the fact that uh, those genetic abnormalities are preventing the cell from working in a healthy way and it's disrupting the mitochondria because the mitochondria is really the center of all metabolism, you know. Um, but we find a lot of children with mitochondrial dysfunction that don't have any genetic abnormalities. Okay. ¿Qué sugerencias de tratamiento recomienda para esta disfunción mitocondrial? Y si este tratamiento es de por vida. What treatment do you recommend for this uh, dysfunction? And is this for life? Uh, that's a great question. You know, we're right at the stage of 
finding a treatment that improves um, children's uh, function. It, if it's for life, um, sometimes it, it can be um, something that needs to be done for a long period of time. I have children that um, um, have more severe mitochondrial dysfunction or mitochondrial disease, and I know that they've um, tried to come off their supplements um, as teenagers and such, as they grow older and want to know if they could, and they, they get very fatigued and they know that they actually need um, those supplements. So it may very well be something that is long-term. Um, there's a number of different very basic uh, treatments for mitochondrial dysfunction, including uh, supporting the mitochondria with many B vitamins and nutrients, and then adding other things like CoQ10, Wabiquinol, carnitine, creatine, and then other things uh, for more severe cases. Con respecto a la activación de, de la microglía en el autismo, ¿se puede postular algún factor desencadenante? About the microglia activation in autism, can any trigger factor be postulated? Um, so I think that the, um, the microglial, um, um, the evidence for microglial activation in autism um, is something that really is, um, um, is very new, needs a lot of research because we know the microglial, although we think of it as neuroinflammation, we also know that the microglial are important in uh, pruning of brain synapses that don't belong. And we know that children with autism seem to have too many connections in some places. So, you know, if that activation is a good thing or a bad thing, I think is still up in the air. And whether it's a good thing or bad thing at different times of your lives, may be something. So I think it's definitely an important lead that we have to understand why the brain um, has not uh, formed the way that the connections haven't formed the way that they should and, and maybe how to correct that. But I don't think that we have um, really the information to say if it's a good thing or a bad thing or when it is a good thing or a bad thing at this point. Okay. Finalmente, me gustaría que pudiera dar alguna sugerencia o comentario a las familias de personas con autismo que muchas veces no encuentran respuestas a determinadas conductas y dificultades en sus niños. Finally, I would like to know you, uh, can you give me some suggestions or comments to families of people with autism who sometimes don't find answers to certain behaviors and issues in their children? And I would say that, you know, um, I think you, you can't stop looking for those answers and you have to continue to persevere to find those answers. Try and find the things that, uh, that is right for your child because it may not be right for another child. So if somebody tells you that this is right or that's right, I think a lot of times you have to find out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, um, and, and I, I can't say, you know, it's, it's easy, but I think that, that it's important that parents know that, um, that they need to be the advocate for their child. And it's important for them to actually be the, the champion to find the answer for their child. Yeah, thank you very much. Dr. Fry, um, thank you for this interview. Uh, I really appreciate, it's a really pleasure to meet you online, <laughs> but we hope you can come to Peru soon. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Okay, see you in Peru next time. <laughs> Sounds great. Gracias a todos por esta noche. Nos vemos. Gracias, doctor. Yeah.